Hey, I'm Lydia. It might seem like this enchanting forest is real, but it's even better. It's VR, and you're looking at its creator. This is nature at its most perfect form, unpolluted, a home to many wild creatures. Those are actually my friend's avatars. One of them is Layla, my best friend, my only real life friend. All the kids used to think I was a freak for my obsession with plants and nature. Then I met Layla, who was also a nature geek in the neighborhood. I knew right away that she and I were gonna be best of friends. We loved all the same weird things, like pickled garlic and growing peppers to make pepper spray. We were basically inseparable, and with Layla by my side, I couldn't care less about what the other kids said anymore. But my world suddenly turned upside down when Layla graduated high school and had to move out for college. Saying goodbye filled me with sadness and fear. Layla was my only friend, and I would feel lost without her. So she came up with the idea of using VR to keep me company. Little did I know, it completely changed my life. VR opened a whole new world for me, giving me the tools to build the land of my dreams, a place where Layla and I could hang out and explore nature the way we used to. Soon enough, I quickly got a grasp on VR and became a big name player in the game. Before long, my life was more virtual than reality. Suddenly, everything was black. I took off the VR headset and mom and dad were standing at the door. Why are you still here? It's the middle of the school day, for God's sake. You've had your head buried in that game since your junior year. Enough is enough. You know what? We've been too easy on her. You need to get into a college at the end of the school year, or we will kick you out of this house. Then how am I supposed to play VR? You know it's my life. Not my problem. You're 18. It's time for you to grow up and face reality. Mom! I'm with your dad on this. Now hurry up and get to school. Later, I reached out to Layla for help. Why don't you apply to my college? Huh, that seems like a good idea. I'd get to see you in person again, right? You'll be out of your parents' reach, and it's an easy school to get into. They just need your high school transcript. Simple. Girl, say no more. Sign me in. Months passed, and it was finally college admission day. Man, it is packed here. Where could I find the school garden? There it is. But where's Layla? There was only a boy sitting here reading a book. He was literally glowing in the sunshine. He suddenly looked up and our eyes met. Ah, oh, that was so awkward. Lydia! Oh my god, I'm so glad you're here! Finally, we've reunited after two years! Layla, I missed you too! I- Oh, you look different. The girl standing in front of me was totally dolled up from top to toes. What happened to her? Oh, you know, I found my style ever since I got here. Don't worry, I'll help you out with your style too. But I like my style. Anyway, do you know what major you're in? I haven't decided yet. Better hurry up, our school has a rule. To stay here, you have to choose a major within your first week. But no biggie, just go to my department, Greenhouse. I'm the class president now. Come on, I'll show you around. Then, Layla led me to her department infrastructure, and I was absolutely impressed. It was equipped with modern experiment and technology and exotic plants. Right then, a group of students swept past me and flocked around Layla. She introduced them as her new friends, but they just gave me the screening from head to toe, then straight up ignored me. Ugh. Rude? Whatever. I need some alone VR time anyway. I put on the headset and doing some boxing moves, but accidentally knocked over something in real life. Layla, why is your friend wearing the VR thing and breaking our stuff? Don't you dare tell me she's from VR. No, no, no. She just uses VR since she's socially anxious. I'll talk to her. Lydia, listen, if you're going to become a greenhouse major, you have to lay off the VR a little bit. You can't be carrying the headset around campus, okay? I confusedly nodded my head. Isn't she also playing VR with me all the time, though? Afterwards, I went to get settled into my dorm room to find a girl playing my fave VR motorcycle race while riding her hoverboard. She's good, but I'm the boss of this game. Instantly, I joined the race and quickly passed her. But man, this girl was fierce. We ended up reaching the finish line at the same time. Whoa, that was epic! I'm Lydia, by the way. It's my first day and I'm assigned to this room. You must be my roommate? Yep, I'm Christine, class president of the VR department. You seem to know VR really well. How long have you been playing? I'm kinda new. Just started two years ago. Sheesh, you've got games, girl. Wanna join our department? The next day, Christine showed me around the VR department, which was full of the newest techs. Dude, this is so sick! Every week, we have an exhibition of new VR technology, and we mainly work and interact in VR. No need for awkward real-life convo. Besides, our department also joined the school annual creativity competition for the huge prize of $10,000, which we could use to develop more modern VR technology. Whoa! This place was heaven! Just imagine playing VR all day, every day! Holy moly, can it be soccer shots enhanced?
I joined in the game immediately and gave it a big kick, scoring a goal. Wait, did I break the pots again? I took off my headset to see a guy doubled over in pain. Oh god, I'm so sorry. Don't worry, I'm good, I'm fine. His face seemed awfully familiar. Oh, I remember you from the school garden the other day. Yeah, that was me. I'm Marshall. Thinking about applying to VR? Yeah, I'm Lydia. Lydia, I think you'd like it here. I suddenly felt my face getting hot when I was saved by a phone call from Layla. I quickly excused myself and ran right into her. Hey, I've been looking everywhere for you. There's a welcome party tonight and you're definitely going. N no, no party. Oh, come on. I'll introduce you to our research group. You've heard about the creativity competition for departments, right? Greenhouse is in it to win it. But no buts. Let's get ready. At the party, Layla dragged me to where the greenhouse kids were hanging out. They were still glaring at me. I should just leave, but on my way out, I bumped into Marshall. Hey, Lydia, I was looking for you. You dropped this handkerchief back at the VR department. It's from your grandma, right? Oh, my God, thank you. But how come you know it's my grandma's? Uh, um, I just guess. I... I saw your initials on it. Hey, back off, you VR freaks! Stop talking with our new member! Poof, are you sure? This morning she seemed really fond of all our gizmos and gadgets. What are you talking about? Lydia, explain this! What's there to explain? Your pea brain can't read between the lines, huh? Layla lunged at Christine and a fist fight broke out between them. That's why I don't fit in in social gatherings. Hey, wanna get out of here? Yes, please. Marshall explained that there was beef between the VR and greenhouse departments. They were neck and neck for many things, especially the scholarship competition. But sometimes, both went too far. The greenhouse put insects in the VR facility rooms, which chewed up all their cables. To get back at them, the VR messed with the water system in the greenhouse, which caused water blackout and killed dozens of plants. And naturally, the presidents, Layla and Christine, were always at each other's throats. Shoot, I was planning on choosing VR as my major, but that would mean turning myself into her enemy. What am I supposed to do? I tried turning back to VR to take my mind off things, but I could hardly concentrate. Lydia, why is your head stuck in the clouds? I've been thinking. I want to be in the VR department. Greenhouse is good, but I'm not sure it's for me. I just don't want us to be enemies. It's okay. We're still friends no matter what you decide. Just follow what feels good in your heart. Aw, she'd put me above all her rivalries? She hadn't changed so much after all. First thing the next morning, I went to apply to the VR department, then caught sight of Layla. Hey, Layla! I made my decision. I've applied for VR department. What? You can't be serious! Choosing VR would mean you're just throwing away your dream and living in an unreal fantasy. Unreal? It's more real than the cool girl with hot friends thing you've got going. And why would you tell me to follow my heart when you clearly didn't think I should? I, I told you that? I nodded my head, confused. I might have slipped my tongue or something. Just think about it again. Something was off. I swear she really seemed genuine yesterday. Over day, I got back to my dorm room only to find out my headset cracked and wouldn't turn on. Who did this? Freaked out, I only thought of one person who could help me fix it now. Marshall. It would take a few days to fix it. Oh no, I couldn't pass a day without VR. <laughs> I think you'll find something to do. Like what? You're more than welcome to hang here. Dang, this guy's cheeky. Suddenly, Marshall's phone rang, and he excused himself for a few minutes. I looked around his room and noticed two VR headsets on the table. Maybe Marshall wouldn't bother if I borrowed a spare set, right? As it turned on, my own forest appeared in front of me. Was he following me? I clicked on his profile to see. He was logged in as Layla. My friend Layla. So, the Layla I've been talking to was not the real Layla, but Marshall? How long had this been going on? And did Marshall know me from the beginning? Lydia? I took off the headset to see Marshall standing there, stunned. What's this? Explain to me now. It all started when I got my department's pricey drone stuck on the roof of the greenhouse building. Layla was up there, so I begged her to give it back to me. She only agreed under one condition, that I had to use her VR account to play with you, without telling you that. At first, I only did it as part of the deal, but after a while, I find her the funniest, smartest, and most creative girl, and I couldn't help but spending time with you. You're telling me that this whole year I've been talking to someone I thought was my best friend, but it was actually just some random guy, and you have the nerve to keep lying to me? Marshall, give me my VR, and stop hovering around Lydia or she's gonna find out. She already did. Lydia, I can explain. Was it because of the stupid rivalry between Greenhouse and VR? What's so important about it that you had to lie to your best friend? You've changed, Layla, and I don't think you're my friend anymore. I stormed off, fighting back tears. I couldn't look at either of them any longer. 
When I got back to my dorm, Christine was already there. I asked her about my VR headset. I actually saw that Layla around our room earlier. She must have done it. That was a low move, Layla. But I was too fed up with her to even be mad. The greenhouse department could be trying to sabotage us again. Now, this is war. I'm going to gather everyone so we can plan our counterattack. Whatever, this rivalry thing is ridiculous anyway. On my first VR free day, I was the only person in my class without their headset. Even the professors engaged through VR. All I could do was sit and stare at people, which reminded me of those lonely days before Layla came into my life. The next few days kept on repeating themselves, until one day, my body started boiling, and my head was buzzing like it was full of bees. Professor, I'm not feeling well. I need to go back to my dorm. But he didn't flinch one bit. No one did, except this guy. Hey, need an aspirin? He extended out his hand, but there was nothing there. A virtual pill? Seriously? No, it doesn't work. Aw, oh, man. Bummer. I tried getting up, but my body grew heavy and weak. I kept calling Christine across the room, but no use. If only Layla was here to help me right now. No, Lydia. You can do this on your own. I leaned on the wall to prop myself up slowly, made my way back to the dorm. I was so close, but my knees trembled and I collapsed. Just then, someone came to scoop me into their arms and picked me up. I woke up in a bad headache to see Marshall cooling it down with a damp towel. Hey, you're awake. Here, have some soup and take some medicine. What are you doing here? I came to return your VR but saw you collapsing, so then I helped you into bed. I know you don't want to talk to me right now, but this was urgent, so thank you, Marshall. I threw myself into his arms and burst into tears. I thought no one was going to help me. He wrapped his arms around me, and I finally felt safe. The next day, thanks to Marshall, I felt loads better, so I went to watch the department's creativity contest. The greenhouse presented their newly bred plant species and got the highest score so far. VR, on the other hand, wasn't so lucky. Our newest development in headsets, uh, exploded. Christine didn't take it well. I tried to comfort her, but she just brushed me off and stormed away. Suddenly, Layla rushed towards me and pulled me into a corner. Lydia, I just want to say I'm sorry. Ever since I got here, I became the center of attention in the VR department. And I got so wrapped up in it. I had to give up playing VR with you. I don't know, Layla. Why couldn't you just tell me that? I didn't want you to be alone. You were always online, so I guess you didn't make any friends back home. That's true. This might sound ridiculous, but only now have I realized that VR isn't everything. No virtual reality can replace the real world. And real friendship goes through all kinds of ups and downs. But it lasts, just like you and I. I'm glad you realized that. And I just want to let you know, no matter what department you choose, I'll support you. Unconditionally. Thanks. But hey, why did you break my VR headset, though? Your VR? No, I didn't do it. I swear. Then how come Christine blamed it on you? I ran down to my dorm to confront Christine, but she wasn't there, and she didn't return for the rest of the night. When I got to class the next day, I put on my headset and found the rest of the department ragging on me, calling me a liar and a traitor. Somehow, pictures of me and Layla talking yesterday were plastered all over the virtual world. The audacity of you to come back here. We already know the greenhouse department is using you to spy on us. It was you who messed with our invention at the department contest. Otherwise, how could it explode? They started booing and surrounding me, so I ran for my life. Until a hand grabbed mine. You could run for real, you know. Ah, uh, yes, at least I'm not the only one virtually running. We made it to the building's entrance, just as the greenhouse student dragging Christine towards us, and the VR students caught up with us. Layla, what's going on? We caught this girl starting a fire in our greenhouse lab with her hoverboard, then tried to flee the scene. What? Why would you do that? It's not on purpose, okay? Then tell us the truth. Now. Fine. So, a day before the department's competition, I secretly made an adjustment to the VR model. But somehow, it caused an error and we ended up losing the prize. I was so mad that I decided to take it out on this greenhouse bunch. Last night, I snuck into your lab, trying to take away all of your research. But suddenly, my hoverboard overheated and exploded, causing a fire to spread everywhere. I freaked out and left. You know the rest? Yeah, thanks to you, our lab was burnt to the ground. You're lucky no one got hurt. And you had the nerve to blame Lydia for losing the contest. I had to. Otherwise, the entire department is on to me. Oh, not just the VR department. 
Now everyone was furious at this crazy manipulative witch. What about my VR headset? Did you break it too? Well, that's just a little trick to get you and Layla to fight. You do belong to VR department after all. That means no making friends with Greenhouse. Right, guys? Guys? You've gone too far this time, Christine. And this rivalry thing is ridiculous anyway. Look where it got you. The VR students couldn't have agreed more. They immediately voted to impeach Christine from her class president role before turning her into the administration. They then apologized on Christine's behalf and offered to help the Greenhouse rebuild their lab. Of course, Layla and the Greenhouse department agreed. It looked like the start of a beautiful partnership. Within a few months, in collaboration with the VR department, the greenhouse was completely remodeled and renovated. No one even cared to mention the feud between the two departments anymore. And guess what? I applied for a second major in greenhouse. Double majoring was tough, but I had the support of Layla and Marshall and our friends in both departments. Speaking of Marshall, he wanted to take me somewhere special in the real world. He covered my eyes and led me there. Now you can look. I could have sworn I was in the VR world, but I wasn't. I could feel and smell the flowers, the soft grass, and Marshall's warm hand holding mine. Lydia, I've been wanting to tell you this for a long time. <clears throat> I don't want to be your virtual friend, or even a friend in real life. I wanted more, so would you like to be my girlfriend? Are you kidding me? Yes, yes, yes! <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Aubrey, a super smart girl with an IQ of 200, and you should be ready for my mind-blowing story. Before I continue, please like and subscribe. I grew up in a small village in the countryside where people farm for a living. My family struggled to put food on the table, so I could only attend a monastery school. But since childhood, I've always been kind of different. The system is crashing. Please wait for a moment. The chicken is $15.55 minus 15%, cereal is $2.49, potatoes, laundry detergent, so the total comes to $64.85 with the discounts and tax included. Mom soon realized I was a gifted child, so she helped me skip some grades, and by the age of five, I was already doing secondary school math. I always topped my classes, and other students would bribe me with candies to ask for help with their homework. At the age of eight, I scored 760 on the SAT math and won the spelling bee competition. I became a phenomenon in the area, and reporters even gave me the Stanford Bennett IQ test, which showed I had the same intelligence as a 22-year and 11-month-old person. My parents were super proud of me, especially my dad. Dad, they all gave me Lego and comics for rewards, as if I was an eight-year-old. Yeah, yeah, they're wrong. You're eight years and five months old already, little lady. He was the only one who could spark interesting conversations with me. That is, until he felt terribly ill. But good surgeons were nowhere to be found in this remote countryside, and we couldn't afford to take him to the center either. We were desperate to see a situation get worse and worse. Then he passed away, leaving us in the depths of despair. Soon after, Mom couldn't afford my school fees anymore, so I had to drop out. Aubrey, I'm so sorry. Don't worry, Mom. There's nothing that school can teach that I can't learn by myself. So she signed me up for a library membership and turned out the best memories I cherished were here, where I could immerse myself in interesting knowledge from all around the world. I was walking down the aisle, absentmindedly running my fingers along the spines of the books, when one caught my eye. And the memories of my dad rushed back to me. If he had been operated on, he'd not have lost. I started turning the first few pages and was captivated immediately. Then suddenly, a fiery desire sparked in my heart. I want to become a surgeon. So I studied every medical book I could find, especially the ones from this author, and decided to save money to enter medical school as soon as possible. To get closer to my dream, I moved out to the city and applied for a job at a coffee shop right next to the medical school. Only... You've broken 10 plates this week already. Are you trying to break a record? Come on, boss. It's just some plates. Not like I burned the whole shop or something. This will be deducted from your salary. Repeat this and you'll be fired. Okay, that's my fault, but I knew he wouldn't fire me. There's no one else who could memorize so many orders all at once. Even Diner Dash Master. Later, I was going to serve a group of students when I heard they were discussing an emergency case. We have to remove that blood clot in segment four of the liver and flush the left lobe. Definitely have to start at the middle hepatic vein. Is this dude serious? Absolutely not. A less intrusive cut would be along the falciform ligament to allow access to segment three. Everyone fell silent and looked at me like I was an alien. Suddenly, the middle-aged man among them stood up. Nice work, young lady. Your method is much more efficient than my student's answer. Which class are you in? Oh, I'm not a medical student but I aspire to be one day. 
The man asked me to sit down and continued asking me other medical questions, and I answered them all with ease. My adrenaline was rushing. Since my dad passed away, I hadn't had such an interesting discussion. Then, a few days later, the man came back and revealed that he was Dr. Sean Lewis and the principal of the medical school. OMG, you're my favorite author! I admire you so much! Thank you, young lady. Anyway, I came here today with an offer. I was impressed by the knowledge you have in the medical field, and I think you deserve a full expense scholarship to the most prestigious medical school. Can someone pinch me now? This was truly a blessing from heaven that I would definitely not let slip away. Here comes my first day. I went to school extra early to explore as much of the campus as possible. This place was so much bigger and better equipped than my old school. I was looking around the hallway to find my class when someone bumped into me. Oh, isn't it the gave the wrong answer guy at the cafe? He just coldly said sorry and hastily headed to the class over there. 412? It's my class too. I learned that he was Henry, the top student of the class. But obviously he wasn't that good. They'll see. All the theoretical classes didn't make me break a sweat, and I even spotted some mistakes made by the professors. When lunch rolled around, I went to the cafeteria, approaching the first group that caught my eye, and they seemed to be friendly. Want some of my fries? Potato fries contain a high amount of trans fat, which is associated with type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. One day you'll have a stroke, and then you'll know why. Thank me later. They all pouted and left right away. Did I say something wrong? Right then, a nice girl came to me. I'm Laura. Mind if I sit? Sure. Then she told me she was isolated too, just because she wasn't as smart as the other students here. Why are they so mean? Hey, why you gotta be bothered by those toxic people? Do they give you a penny for your thoughts? It's not about how many friends you make. It's about finding one that knows your worth. You're right. I'm Aubrey, by the way. I know, I was in the same class with you this morning. And the way you argue with our professor? Wow, that's impressive. Laura and I quickly became friends. It's great to have her around who could truly see my brilliance and always encouraged me to express myself. Today came a big event. A conference was held by none other than Dr. Lewis. But little did I know that this event would become a battleground between Henry and I. Determined to impress Dr. Lewis, I eagerly raised my hand at every opportunity to answer his inquiries. Each time I did, Henry would swiftly raise his hand as well, competing for Dr. Lewis's attention. We argued back and forth, neither backing down until the end of the conference. After that, Dr. Lewis announced that there was one slot available in his upcoming research project, which would go to the top student of this term. The room buzzed with excitement and anticipation. My heart skipped a beat, for working with Dr. Lewis had been a lifelong dream. However, other students started cheering Henry's name. Jeez, I swore I would beat his butt off and show them who deserved it. Time to prove that I was not only unmatched in theory, but also in practice. I was the very first one to finish stitching up the incision. Uh Uh-huh. But as I reached for my gauze, I couldn't find it anywhere. It must be around here, I swear. Oh no, I left it inside the dummy. Okay, this time must be better. How hard could it be to use this defibrillator? But then I accidentally touched the metal pad and got shocked and fell backward. I kept trying in many other practice sessions, but that sucked. Aubrey, this cast looks exactly like a chicken thigh. Do it again. But the most annoying thing was that Henry excelled in all of them and other students started mocking me. After that, I went outside for some fresh air and deep down, I was so disappointed in myself for all my failures. Suddenly, a hand gently patted my shoulder. It was Laura. I couldn't help but hug her and start sobbing. Laura, what if I was wrong about myself? I failed at everything and people started humiliating me. Oh, they just envy you. Nobody can beat your academic scores. That's why they gloated at your failure in practice. But that big brain of yours is what matters the most, right? Yeah? And an opportunity is coming your way. There's an intelligence contest next week. If you win, everyone will have to recognize that you're the best, including Henry. Talk about Laura, my savior. I'll try my best. Just wait and see. A few days later, Laura took me to the library in a private study room. She helped me set up my laptop and left me alone so I could focus. Good luck. I participated in an online oral contest over Skype. There was a panel of judges who asked questions, and all I had to do was answer them verbally. Easy peasy. Now I just need to wait for the results. The next day, I went to school as usual, but then suddenly was called to the principal's office. Dr. Lewis might have known about that competition and saw my name on the top list. 
I was about to brag about my performance when he accused me of helping other students cheat on their exam. Then he showed me a voice recording of me answering the questions. Wasn't that for the intelligence contest? But Laura said, Dr. Lewis, just wait. I can explain. I frantically called Laura, but she refused to pick up. Enough. I'm so disappointed in you. You're expelled from this moment. Feeling lost and crushed, I trudged myself to a bench in the schoolyard. Hey, are you okay? Okay? You're mocking me? Now that project slot is yours. Happy much? Get out of my sight now! Suddenly a stack of papers fell onto my lap. You might need this. Good luck. I believe you're not a cheater. I confusedly flipped through those papers to see that these were all of Henry's notes from the semester for practice lessons, which could not be found in normal textbooks or lectures. I kept on turning to the last page and saw a scribble. Know your worth. Something awakened inside me, so I swallowed my pride and ran after Henry. Hey, wait! I I've been wrong about you the whole time. I'm sorry. Don't be. It's my fault to act competitively, too. I had no bad intentions. It was just the motivation for me to study harder. I swear. But it's a pity if the medical industry loses someone like you. Um, well, I'm not so sure anymore. I'm used to doing everything so quickly and I can't be patient, which probably explains my clumsiness. That I can help with. Genius is 1% talent and 99% hard work, you know. Since then, I often went to Henry's house to practice. We studied together and he taught me many tips to stay calm, patient, and focused. And turns out, he's also quite the adorable type. Here you go. Thank you, doctor. This is the best stitch I've ever had. One day, I ran into Laura at a gas station. She tried to hide, but I ran straight there to catch her. How could you trick me like that and just disappear like nothing happened? I'm so sorry, Aubrey. I was so blind and just wanted to help those who are bad at studying like me. I never expected it to be that serious and you'd get expelled. And now, why are you here? It's just the medical profession was not my thing, so I quit. But Aubrey, please forgive me. I'm really ashamed of what I did and you were... The only one who had truly been kind to me. <sighs> only when you set things straight and confess everything to Dr. Lewis. But even so, there isn't a likely chance we'll be friends again. So the next day, Henry took Laura and I to see Dr. Lewis. Aubrey, Laura, what are you both doing here? Dr. Lewis, I... <sighs> I was the one behind the cheating case. Aubrey had no idea and didn't deserve to be punished for my fault. I've been practicing a lot too, sir. Look at these. I've been so careful with every single one. Aubrey has also helped me a lot in our project. I hope you can forgive her and grant her another chance. Dr. Lewis looked quite satisfied, but then he suddenly turned pensive and shook his head. Medical school is not where people can freely join and leave. A doctor needs an extra sharp mind and can be fooled as easily as you were. I'm sorry, Aubrey, but you're not qualified. My heart sank to my toes, and I locked myself inside my apartment for the next couple of days. It wasn't until Henry knocked at my door that I actually went outside. He said he wanted to cheer me up and bring me to his favorite restaurant. I sat down waiting while Henry went to get the drinks. Hey! But a second later, he slipped on the stairs and fell down with a thud with all the broken glass scattering around. It's all right. I, I think I only twisted my ankle. Not a big deal. But my stomach dropped when I noticed a trail of blood on the floor and something protruding from his ankle. A large shard of glass. I swiftly dialed a 911 while Henry winced in pain. Aubrey, you have to administer first aid. Oh, right. I called for the restaurant staff to get the first aid kit, but it was clear that the situation was dire. Henry's face grew pale as blood continued to trickle from the wound. I held the wound closed to stop the blood, but my heart felt weak. I couldn't bear to see him suffer. You trust me, Henry? What do you mean? Yes? So I immediately pulled out the toolkit that I brought around in my purse. Henry bit down on the tablecloth beside us, and I started the procedure. I maintained a steady stream of chatter, trying to distract him from the pain, but it wasn't helping. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. What? Just to distract myself from the pain. Okay, go ahead. Stand a little taller. And done. When I looked up, there was a crowd cheering in awe and admiration. Guys, I caught the whole thing live. The video of the incident quickly went viral. That night, I tossed and turned in bed, unable to contain my excitement. I saved a human life! Reading the comments of the video filled me with a renewed sense of motivation to pursue my dream. The following morning, I was jolted awake by a notification on my phone. It was an email from Dr. Lewis himself.
I headed to Dr. Lewis's office, and to my surprise, he told me he saw the video and gently said, Aubrey, I was once like you, arrogant and overly reliant on my natural intelligence. Then, a mistaken surgery left me with regret that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. However, after watching the video, I'm glad that you changed. I saw your humility and eagerness to learn, so I'll give you another chance. So, here I am. You have no idea how much I miss this hallway. Welcome back. How's your ankle doing? Much better, thanks to you. How about a celebration dinner tonight? Sounds great, but promise you won't need me to operate on you again. I was scared to death. Ahead of me still lay a long road, but I believe the day I become a skilled surgeon is closer than ever. And soon I can perform more life-saving surgeries for the less fortunate. Dad, I will make you proud. Hey guys, it's me, Milo. I'm back again to share the next part of my story with you. Firstly, here's a quick recap. So my ex Deanna cheated on me with some college doofus, and in doing so broke my heart. So I decided that if I couldn't be happy, then neither could anyone else. So around Valentine's Day, I messed with other couples. One such prank led me to meet Vanessa. Then I found myself falling for her. The problem is she has a boyfriend, and he's a jerk. And the even bigger problem is that I just found out that she's my ex's little sister. And there's a chance I may have told Vanessa some pretty harsh truths about her sister. But in my defense back then, I didn't realize they were siblings. At first, I had no idea how to deal with the situation. So I just decided to avoid everyone. If I saw Vanessa at school, then I darted around the corner into the restroom behind an overweight kid. You know, anything that meant I didn't have to face her. The problem was I found myself missing her too much. I felt like I couldn't live without her. So no matter the consequences, I had to do something now. So I walked up to her at lunch and told her I'd been avoiding her because I couldn't cope with seeing her so upset over her boyfriend that didn't deserve her and it was wrong of him to hit her and she should get out now while she still could. Then I told her I'd always be there for her and hopefully as more than just friends. She seemed touched. She knew there were a lot of problems in their relationship too but admitted she'd been in denial about it all. She held my hand and said that she had feelings for me too. But now we had to deal with her boyfriend first. Ugh, her boyfriend Kane. He was the short-tempered kind of guy who solves everything with a punch. He will never accept it if she breaks up with him. It would dent his pride too much, and probably result in him being violent toward her. While to be honest, I'm too much of a coward. I couldn't protect her in that case. If he knew she was breaking up with him to be with me, well, then that's the end for me. So I thought long and hard about this, and then, voila! I derived a master plan. If he couldn't handle Vanessa breaking up with him, then we'll make him break up with her. <laughs> wow, <laughs> am I a genius or what? The next day I told Vanessa the plan. It's simple. She just needs to intentionally look sloppy, stinky, and ugly in front of him so he would soon tire of her. When she first heard it, she wasn't impressed and said, that's so embarrassing, I can't do that. No girl wants to look like a mess. I told her that she would only have to do it in front of him. Besides, he went to a different school to us, so she could still look like her usual pretty self in class. Eventually, she agreed to do it, and as I expected, just after a few weeks of playing ugly, Kane had enough and broke up with her. Vanessa came around to mine and excitedly told me the news. She'd gone to Kane's place without any makeup on, wearing some stained oversized shirt, her hair a mess, and she hadn't even brushed her teeth. Then, when he ended it with her, she pretended to cry. <laughs> I couldn't believe this good girl could act pretty well too. Then, seizing the occasion, I asked her to be my girlfriend, and she of course said yes. Then we kissed, and well, <laughs> talk about amazing. She was such a better kisser than her sister. We kept our relationship low-key at first. This worked for her as she didn't want to rub our relationship in Kane's face. And it worked for me as I didn't want Deanna to find out. Then, after a month of dating, she dropped the bomb. I want you to meet my sister. She's in college and lives in another city, but she's currently home for vacation. I should officially introduce you to her first, since we don't know when she will leave again. I could have screamed out, but instead, I kept my cool and asked to see a picture of her. Then on seeing one, I feigned being shocked and said that this girl always picked on me during middle school and I was still traumatized from it, that those were the darkest years of my life. I mean, I didn't actually know Deanna back in middle school, probably because she was a year older than me, but Vanessa didn't need to know this. 
Vanessa felt bad for me and said she didn't know that there was that side to her sister. She said it was true that Deanna was pretty cranky in middle school, but thought that that was just puberty. She never realized she was actually a mean girl, especially not to a younger kid. By this point, I might as well have been cast in some soap opera as my performance was a class act. I must have looked so pathetic that she told me it's okay, and she'd not mention Deanna anymore until I felt comfortable about it. This solved my ex problem, for now, but it didn't solve the Kane problem, as he found out about Vanessa and me, and he wasn't happy. My guess is Kane must have stalked Vanessa and spotted us together. Then he followed me home, as that crazy dude showed up on my doorstep and yelled at me to stay away from her. Well, I couldn't blame him. No one on earth ever likes their ex's new partner. Not only did this crazy guy know where I lived, but now my sister Kayla also knew about my relationship with Vanessa. Since she's still bitter about the Valentine prank I pulled on her, recap, it involved her, her boyfriend, and a whole lot of duct tape. So it wasn't overly surprising when she smirked at me and said, just you wait and see. I haven't forgot about what you did to me on Valentine's, and now seems like the perfect time for revenge. <laughs> I repeated her words in a mocking tone to annoy her, but to be honest, deep down in my gut, I did feel on the anxious side. She's just as crazy of a prankster as I am. Now, I always had to be on guard. After that, my sister and Kane seemed to take turns to ruin our dates. Jeez, didn't they have anything better to do? One time, I was kissing Vanessa out in the yard. Suddenly, there was water pouring down from nowhere. We were completely soaked. I looked around and saw my sister standing on the second floor balcony holding an empty bucket and said, Oops, I was just trying to water the flowers. Then on a movie date night, Kane showed up at the same film, sat in the row behind us, and kept on kicking the back of my seat, and even threw popcorn at me. Later when I went home and checked the hood of my hoodie, there were all kinds of trash and enough popcorn for the next movie date. How childish. It was all trivial stuff, really, but it was getting annoying. Then on our two-month anniversary, I told Vanessa to dress up all nice, then I took her to the swanky Italian restaurant. The meal was amazing, until when I reached into my pocket and took out my wallet to pay. Then, to my horror, a picture of a bikini-wearing girl fell out of nowhere. I was so shocked and just froze in confusion. Vanessa looked so upset. I explained that I'd never seen that picture before in my life, and I had no idea who the girl was. Then the waiter showed up with the card machine. I clumsily opened my wallet, but none of my cards were there. I searched my pockets again in panic, but nothing, not even a penny. Bright red, I muttered out that I had no money on me. This was the worst moment of my life. I thought I was going to lose my girlfriend and have to pot wash. But then I heard arguing coming from outside. Me, Vanessa, and the waiter all stared out the window and saw my sister and Kane yelling at each other. We stepped outside and listened in on their conversation. Turns out my sister had taken all the cards out of my wallet so I wouldn't be able to pay. She's been peeking in from the window all night long and spying on us, just to wait and see my pathetic face as I found out that all of my cards have vanished into thin air. But then she was disappointed that it didn't go to plan because I was busy explaining to Vanessa about some stupid photo instead. That's when she met eyes with some crazy guy who was standing next to her and laughing his ass off in satisfaction, which you can already tell who he was, the mastermind of that bikini photo prank. Kayla got annoyed and picked a fight with Kane because now she felt like her prank had been overlooked and she wasn't happy about it. It's kind of dumb, really. As if they weren't so proud and headstrong, they could have watched me miserably try to squirm my way out of the no cards and picture of another girl fiasco. Instead, they'd been caught red-handed setting me up. Vanessa pointed at Kane and said to the waiter, he'll pay for our meal. Then she grabbed my arm and pulled me away. So yeah, we left my sister and Kane to their arguing and I took Vanessa home. Then, a few days later, Kane sent me a message. It's amazing what delving into your past can bring up. I know all about you and Deanna. Set me up on a date with your sister or else I'll tell Vanessa everything. Dang it. Who would have thought after that stupid incident that crazy Kane guy would catch feelings for my evil little sister? In hot sweats, I replied that my sister already had a boyfriend. Unsurprisingly, Kane didn't care about this factor. He told me a time and a place and said my sister better be there else he wouldn't just tell Vanessa about Deanna. He'd also 100% ruin my life. OMG, what am I supposed to do now? Do I really have to set up a date for my little sister with a crazy guy like Kane? Oh well, she's not really sane either, but she's still my sister. 
But if I don't agree to help him, then who knows what could happen to me tomorrow? I mean, I don't want Vanessa to find out about Diana. And I also don't want to end up a beaten up mess. I'm so torn. This is killing me. Have any of you ever worn braces before? If you have, I feel for you. I really hope your experience was better than mine. I thought braces would make my life so much better, but oh boy, was I wrong. It all started because of how ugly my teeth were. They were short and had such big gaps between them. My friends sometimes made jokes about them and it really hurt my feelings, but I tried to hide how I felt and laugh along with them. Because my parents worked away all the time, I lived with my grandparents in New Jersey, and they never thought there was any problem with my teeth. They said they'd grow as I got older, but honestly, I couldn't handle the teasing anymore. Eventually, I decided to take matters into my own hands. Every time my parents sent me pocket money, I'd save every cent. By my senior year of middle school, I'd finally saved up enough money, and so I went to the dentist and asked him for braces. My dentist said I need to wear them for about two years, and I thought that wouldn't be such a big deal, right? I mean, a few of my friends had braces too, and they still looked pretty. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case for me. My teeth were so messed up that normal braces just wouldn't cut it. My one friend had recently got these invisible braces, so I asked my dentist if I could get the same ones, but he said I needed something more hardcore. I ended up with black iron braces, and they made me look even uglier than before. How stupid I'd been to think that braces would magically make my teeth better. My friends thought it was hilarious and said I looked like I had train tracks inside my mouth. Everyone was laughing at me and slowly I started to distance myself from them. Those days were some of the worst of my life and all I wanted was to run away where no one would know me. So after I graduated from middle school, I persuaded my parents to let me go live with them in New York. I figured that I could start again with a clean slate at my new school. But seeing as I still had two years to go with the braces, I needed to make a plan. I didn't want to be the kid everyone laughed at anymore, so I decided to fake being mute so that I could hide my braces. On the first day at my new school, I'd prepared a letter that said I was mute due to oral surgery affecting my larynx, and that I was in the recovery phase, but it could take years to heal. I even faked my parents' signatures. Luckily for me, they were too busy to take me to school on my first day, so everything was going to plan. I thought someone might be at least a little suspicious, but no one asked me about it. And even the teachers gave me sympathy and said everything would be okay, and I'd still do well in my classes. I couldn't believe it. I knew I had to be careful though. So I separated myself from the other kids so they wouldn't try and talk to me. I didn't even eat lunch in the cafeteria because I was too afraid people would see how embarrassing I looked when I ate. I seriously had to open my mouth wide and chew super carefully. And afterwards, there was always chunks of food stuck in my braces. But ugly teeth aside, I actually wasn't bad looking. In fact, thanks to the braces, I'd lost 10 kilograms. So my body was looking quite good. If I didn't open my mouth, I was kind of pretty. And because I kept myself separate from everyone, there was an air of mystery about me. After a week or so, a few guys started approaching me, trying to flirt with me, but I just ignored them. I knew if I opened my mouth, it would be game over. I could see they thought I was a bit of a diva, but it was better than revealing my ugly secret. There was one guy called Jake that I secretly liked though, and I knew he liked me too, as he always tried to speak to me. But of course, I ignored him, and it made me feel so bad. Anytime he came up to me, I'd pretend to be busy or act like he was invisible. I wish I could just be honest with him, but then he wouldn't be into me. I mean, what guy wanted to date a girl with braces like mine? And as for the girls, they didn't like me one bit. One time, a girl in my class called Angela tried to ask me a question, and I just walked away from her. She shouted after me, asking me why I was being so rude and said that no one had ever ignored her before. She was the most popular girl at school, and ever since that day, she started to treat me so badly. I heard her whispering to her friends that I should be at a school for disabled kids, and then one day she even came and told me that to my face. I was so upset. This school was just as bad as my old one. I didn't understand how people could be so mean. But that was nothing. It was about to get worse. One day, I woke up with a cold, 
I couldn't stop coughing and sneezing, but there was no way I could miss school as we had an exam that day. I decided to wear a face mask so no one would see my braces if I had to cough or sneeze. When I finished the exam, I was at my locker and suddenly the biggest sneeze came. I ended up sneezing five times in a row and afterwards I said, Jesus, out loud as a reflex. Then I panicked. I was supposed to be mute and I just spoken. What if someone heard me? Well, someone did. I turned around and Angela was standing there with her friends. They were looking at me in shock and Angela said, I thought you couldn't speak, hmm? Then she walked towards me and reached out to pull my mask off. Suddenly Jake appeared and stopped her. He told her to back off and then he stood there protecting me. No one had done something so nice for me in years. That's when Jake and I started hanging out. We would go to the library for walks in the forest and even play piano together. I used a small notebook to write down whatever I wanted to say to him. And of course, I just smiled, never laughed when I was with him. But then one day he leaned in to kiss me and the worst thing ever happened. The thought of his lips touching the metal braces in my mouth made me disgusted with myself. So when his lips touched mine, I got such a fright, I basically had butted him. And when I realized what a stupid thing I was doing, blood was pouring out of his nose. Both of us frantically tried to stop the bleeding. I felt so ashamed of what I'd done that I had to try so hard not to cry in front of him. And he also blushed shyly. After that, it was hard to fully relax with him. Even though I liked him so much, I was so afraid that he'd catch a glimpse of my monster teeth and then break up with me. Little did I know what was just around the corner. One morning I was walking to my locker when I realized everyone was staring at me. I felt so self-conscious and didn't understand why they were all looking at me. And then I saw it. Plastered across my locker were tons of photos of me. And they were all of me from middle school. From when I hadn't worn braces to when I had it full of my mouth. They were the worst photos ever. I was ugly and fat in them and I couldn't believe someone could be so cruel. As I stood there in shock, Angela walked up to me and said, You're a liar. A monster pretending to be a mute little princess. Well, the truth is out now. Then she turned to everyone watching us and told them I really could speak. Turns out her cousin was in my old middle school. They'd been hanging out and she told Angela that I wasn't mute and hadn't had any surgery and that I just had ugly teeth. When she triumphantly walked past me, my anger flared up and for a moment I lost control. I rushed in and pushed her down the hallway. Then I jumped in to sit on her back and started pulling her hair and then I saw blood and that's the moment when I realized I'd taken it too far. Her front teeth had broken when she'd fallen. Everyone was taking photos. I was sitting on Angela's back holding her hair and my mouth was wide open revealing hideous braces. Jake was also present in the crowd and looked at me in awe. I don't know if it was me or Angela who was more humiliating in this situation. After that, Angela had to wear big black iron braces just like me. The dentist said there were problems with her root canal, so she couldn't have implants. The only solution was wearing braces and hoping that her other teeth would move and fill the gaps. And my parents had to come to the school and apologize. And of course, I was suspended for what I did, not just for pushing Angela, but also the fact I forged my parents' signature. Jake never spoke to me again, which broke my heart. But what hurt even more was what happened a few weeks later. I found out Jake and Angela started dating. I couldn't believe it. I knew Angela was only doing it to get back at me, but it made me wonder, did that mean Jake didn't find girls with braces ugly? Why did I hide mine then? And there's one thing I still want to know. How do they kiss when Angela has a mouthful of braces? Hey guys, Ellie here, again. I'm going to share with you the final part of my story, and trust me, you won't want to miss it. In part two of my story, my revenge plan really got underway. Brian went to New York to work for three months, and I managed to seduce Clark. Now we're dating, and I almost have all the info I need to make Sasha's company crash. But after an amazing day out with Clark, I came home, and you will not believe what was waiting for me. Brian was there. He was sitting in my living room, and he looked so angry. He'd flown home that afternoon and couldn't wait to spend that weekend with me. But when he arrived at my house to surprise me, I wasn't there. He was about to call me to ask where I was when he received a photo from his friend. It was of me and Clark. Turns out his friend had seen us sharing a picnic by the Golden Gate Bridge and had sneakily taken a photo of us kissing each other and sent it to Brian. And he was mad. He started shouting at me, saying, How could you cheat on me like this? 
He looked heartbroken and all I could do was cry. I couldn't even explain myself because the truth was much worse. If he knew it was just to hurt his mom, he'd never forgive me. In the end, he stormed out, leaving me there crying. But I had to be strong. I had to focus on my revenge. I didn't have time to sit and cry over Brian. For now, I'd have to put him to the side and try not to think about him. When Monday rolled around, I was exhausted. I'd barely slept the whole weekend and couldn't bear going to work. But I had no choice. The day dragged by, and by the time 5 p.m. rolled around, I waited until everyone left, and then I went to Clark's office. I gave him a hug, and he started massaging my neck, and said, Baby, you look so tired. What's up? I replied, saying, No, I'm good. In fact, I'm much better now that I've seen you. Although, I would say no to a cup of coffee. Of course, Clark happily went and made me one, and as soon as he was out of the room, I ran to his desk and started rummaging around looking for the documents. But I couldn't find them anywhere. Had he put them in a drawer? I quickly checked, but while I was doing that, Clark walked back into the room. Ellie, what are you doing? I got the fright of my life and stood up saying, um, nothing, just helping you tidy up your desk. It's such a mess. At that moment, my phone suddenly beeped. I went to grab it, but Clark got to it first. Oh no. Suddenly his face changed as he read my text. Then he said, what's going on, Ellie? You better explain yourself quick. He handed me my phone back and I couldn't believe it. It was my old colleague, Amy, asking if I'd got the last document yet to show how the app was put together. I felt so sick and I knew I couldn't lie anymore. I looked back up at Clark, and in tears I told him everything. Clark, I know you're probably going to hate me after I tell you this, and I don't blame you, but please just hear me out. Sasha is a nasty woman. She was actually my dad's mistress when I was a kid, and she tore apart my family. I'm so sorry, Clark, but I'm actually engaged to Brian, Sasha's son. I only took this job because I wanted to find a chance to ruin her business and life, as soon as I saw Sasha was interested in you, I decided to try and get you to like me, so that I can let her know what it's like when she loses someone she loves. Then, by using you, I'd take all the confidential info to... to... Ugh! Oh, I'm so sorry, Clark! By the time I'd finished telling him, I was crying so much I could barely breathe, and I knew Clark would be deeply upset. But instead, something crazy happened. He came over and hugged me. He told me to calm down, and then he said, Revenge is pointless, Ellie. It doesn't do anyone any good, especially not you. I know Sasha hurt you, but you need to let that go. It's in the past now. Sure, it might make you feel good right now, but in the long run, will you be any happier? I just cried even more then. Why was he still being so nice to me? I didn't deserve this. I kept apologizing, and he said he understood why I'd done it all, and that he forgave me. He said, I know you have a good heart in there. You just got a little lost. That's all. But promise me one thing. Please don't hand over the documents to your old company. Our company has worked so hard on this. Please don't do it, Ellie. Well, it was the least I could do after everything I'd done to him so far. I promised not to hand the documents over, and after I left Clark in the office, I realized something. I actually liked him. Not just as a friend or colleague, but as something more. I had actual feelings for him. And now I'd gone and hurt him so much, I felt awful. And there were still a couple of other things I had to deal with, too. As soon as I got home, I called Brian. But he didn't answer. I knew I couldn't wait any longer, so I left him a voice message explaining everything. I ended the message by saying, Sorry. But I knew Brian would struggle to forgive me, and I didn't blame him. Not only had I cheated on him, I'd even tried to harm his mom. Anyway, she was his mom, even if she'd done bad stuff in her past. The next morning, I quit my job. People were shocked, but I just told them I wanted to go home and be with my mom. When I was packing my stuff at my office, I found a notepaper from Clark, saying, Leave the grief behind and live happily, my darling. A good girl like you deserves happiness. So Clark wasn't angry with me at all. That's enough. Now I could leave without any worries. Over the next few days, I packed up all my stuff and left San Fran. My heart was aching the whole time, but I knew I needed to get out of there and clear my head. I just checked in at the airport when Brian called me. I was so nervous to answer his call. 
as I hadn't heard back from him since I left the voice message. I held my breath as I accepted the call and prepared for him to shout at me. But it didn't happen. Still, with his usual sweetness and calm, he told me he was so shocked by my message he hadn't known what to say to me. It had taken him a few days to think everything through, and now he said he was ready to talk. I'm not mad at you, Ellie, he said, but you should have shared your childhood stuff with me earlier. And why didn't you tell me that it was my mom your dad ran off with? We could have worked through this. I'm so sorry my mom was the one that tore your family apart. But she's different now. Please just give her a chance. Brian, I'm sorry for everything. I'm glad that you're not angry with me. But to forgive your mom? I think I need more time. It seemed that Brian was about to say something, but that's when I heard the airport announcement asking passengers in my flight to proceed to the boarding gate. Therefore, I had no choice but to hang up the phone. Um, Brian, listen. I'm so sorry, but my plane is ready for boarding. Can I call you back soon? Huh? Where are you going? He asked. I told him I was going to stay with my mom for a bit. Well, I reckon that it'll be better for you now. Take your time and think things through, especially our relationship. I was startled as he said, our relationship, but realized he was right. I definitely needed some time to work things out. Could I ever forgive Sasha? I loved Brian, but was that love big enough to leave all this behind? I mean, I didn't know whether I could see Sasha as my mother-in-law or not. And how would my mom react to this? I got on the plane and sat down. For the first time in months, my heart felt more peaceful again, and I felt like I could really sleep. It's right. Neither Brian nor Clark hated me. Things would be okay. I was just about to close my eyes when I heard someone say my name. I looked up, and to my complete shock, Clark was walking down the aisle of the plane. He sat in the seat right opposite me and turned to me with the biggest grin and said, I've never been to L.A. before. Want to be my tour guide? Oh my god, I couldn't believe this. What was he doing here? I was so shocked to see him, but at the same time, there was no denying the excitement I felt. No one could ever say I led a boring life, that's for sure. I gave Clark a smile and said, sure, to him. I have no idea what the future holds for me, but I guess I'll find out soon. Wish me luck. Hi, I'm Sarah, and I'm here to tell you how my not-so-small problem changed the course of my life. When it comes to butts, well, there are lots of names for them, such as tush, behind, backside, bottom, and so on. Trust me, I've heard them all countless times. You see, I have a big butt. In proportion to the rest of me then, well, it's undeniably massive. My mom and dad both have pretty big butts, so combine both of their genes together and you end up with me. Ever since I was a little kid, strangers passed comments on the size of my butt. I remember being in a grocery store once, innocently looking in the candy aisle, when a woman came up to my mom and said, your baby, is she all right? Because her backside seems to be very big. Yeah, seriously, some people were that rude. And the older I got and the bigger my butt grew, then the worse their comments became. Teenage me? Well, I had a hard time. At the time when I hit puberty, my butt became even more enormous than boys didn't look at my face anymore. Instead, they only seemed to notice my butt. One boy was staring at it so hard that he walked straight into his locker and gave himself a concussion. Then there were the seats at school. I mean, why did they have to be so tiny? I'd rather stand up than try to fit in them. But no choice for me. I had to literally squeeze myself onto it, then do a wiggle routine to get out of it. And in fact, whenever I tried to sit down, someone always pointed and laughed at me. Talk about awkward. This popular girl called Mary always went out of her way to tease me. One day, I was wandering down the hallways when Mary stuck her foot out and tripped me over, and then said, No one likes you, tushy face. I looked up at her, and that's when I realized I'd had enough. I must do something to stop this. As she triumphantly walked past me, my anger flared up, and for a moment, I lost control. I rushed in and pushed her. The next moment, she fell down the stairs and lay there unconscious. I stood stunned watching her. I hadn't noticed that we were standing near the stairs. 
Seeing that, her group of mean girls rushed in and started to hit me. I just couldn't do anything but lay on the ground and keep my head. Then, a voice piped up at the back of the crowd. Leave her alone. It isn't her fault that she has a big bum. It was this girl called Anita. After that, we started hanging out more, both in school and out of it. Having Anita by my side made me feel stronger, and the mean comments about my butt size didn't bother me so much anymore. My life at school got a bit better. Then one day, this rich kid at school was holding a huge senior party at his family mansion. For the first time in a long time, I felt confident enough to go. I arrived at the party wearing my cutest dress. I saw Mary with her large gang of wannabes, but I knew there'd be lots of trouble if she saw me, so I chose to avoid her. Then I spotted Thomas, the most handsome, sweetest guy I knew. I'd pretty much had a crush on him since preschool, but I'd always been too self-conscious to tell him about it. Go and talk to him! Anita gave me a gentle nudge forward. Go on, before Mary gets to him first. My nerves took over, so I said to her, But what if he isn't interested? She rolled her eyes at me. Not gonna happen! Now go! He seemed happy to see me, and we both hung out and drank a lot. Then we snuck off upstairs to the master room. We sat on the bed, and he looked at me. Like, really looked at me. Then said, I really like you, Sarah. And I think you're the most beautiful girl in school. I blushed. This was the sweetest thing a boy had ever said to me. Then he leaned in and kissed me. OMG, talk about amazing. We were passionately kissing when the door burst open and someone shouted, Why are you with her? It was a furious looking Mary. She continued yelling at us both and even tried to hit me. But Thomas protected me. Then he took my hand and led me out of the room. Mary continued to shout mean comments at me, but I didn't care. Thomas liked me, and she just needed to deal with it. A week later, Thomas asked me out, and I said yes. Being his girlfriend was the best thing ever, as he made me feel so special. Suddenly, having a big butt didn't seem to matter. In fact, Thomas said it only added to my beauty. Then one day at school, I was sitting in class when an announcement came over the speaker. Sarah Montgomery, please report to the principal's office right away. The principal said that Mary's parents had reported the fight between me and Mary, and I was the one who started it first. So I was expelled. I was so mad that I didn't even bother clearing up my locker. Instead, I just stormed out of there. I ended up at a different school, and I tried my best to focus on my studies. I wanted to go to college and study drama, as I loved acting, and believed my unique body shape would be a big selling point in the industry. Thomas and I continued to date. He always supported me and made me feel like I was capable of doing anything. I didn't see much of Anita anymore, but we kept in touch. One day, I was studying in a cafe when a man came over to me, passed me his business card, and told me that with a butt like mine, I could make serious money modeling. So that's how I became a photo model. Turns out the man hadn't been lying about the money. Okay, so I wasn't an actress, yet, but I earned loads. Finally, the part of my body I was so ashamed of made me super successful. I paid off all my college fees and gave my parents back all the money I'd loaned off them. A few months later, I was on a date with Thomas, and in the middle of dinner, he bent on one knee and pulled out a ring and said, Sarah, will you marry me and make me the happiest man alive? Overcome with joy, I shouted out, Yes, 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 I will marry you. Finally, the day of our wedding arrived and I was so excited. After everything I'd been through, I was finally going to marry my charming prince. I had the most amazing fairy tale dress and the perfect castle venue. Better still, Anita was there as my maid of honor. As I was dancing, I saw Jack, who was my drop-dead gorgeous cousin, and he just came to join my wedding party. Anita had always been looking to meet him. I was so excited and decided that tonight was the perfect time for Anita to get access to him. I went looking for her, but she wasn't on the dance floor or by the bar, so I searched upstairs. I was about to open one of the doors when I heard a male voice coming from within. I'll try and get some money off her. Just give me a few weeks, okay? Then I heard a girl's voice say, But honey, we need the money now, and I don't like Sarah. She's more butt than person. 
Then the guy said, You know I don't love her. I only love you. I looked through the crack in the door and saw the two of them kissing. Then I registered who they both were. It was Thomas and Anita. My new husband was kissing my best friend on our wedding day. Angrily, I ran into the room and threw my shoe at Thomas's head. Unfortunately, he ducked in time. Seeing me, Anita was extremely terrified and immediately ran out of the room, leaving just me and Thomas there. I shouted at him. You're a jerk! Anything to say? Huh? Thomas looked at me in panic and confessed to me all. So Thomas told me how he'd liked me back in school, but over time, his feelings for me changed, and he found himself falling for Anita. He was going to break up with me, but then I ended up being successful. Seeing as he'd been the one supporting me, he thought it was only fair that he got a share of my money. So him and Anita constructed this whole wedding plan to take half of my money. I was so shocked. I had to sit on the ground. My heart felt like it was shattering in my chest. Then I opened my mouth and screamed at the top of my voice. I ran out of that place crying and the wedding was cancelled. I'm not gonna lie, it's been hard. Being betrayed by the man I loved and my best friend was painful. I shed a lot of tears over them, but I refused to shed any more. Turns out, Thomas wasn't the man for me, but I believe that my perfect man is out there somewhere. My backside may be exceptionally large, but I'm still a real person with real feelings. I only wish the world was more understanding, but for now, I'm using my butt to progress in my career, and I have a feeling I'm gonna be just fine. Always be you, and never let anyone take away your shine. If you try so hard to fit in and be normal, then you'll never find out how truly amazing you are and how you were born to stand out. Hi, it's me again, Adeline, the devoted college student and part-time piano teacher. Do you remember me? As promised in the previous section, I came back to tell you more about my story. So, here's a quick recap. The only way I can afford to stay at college was by securing the one scholarship space available. The problem was that the smart guy Ryan was standing in my way. So I used my charms to convince him he should mess up his exam, so I got the spot. Yeah, I know, this was lame of me. But then I realized I was falling for him. So I saw sense and was about to tell him to try his best in the exam. Only my mean roommate, Dee Dee, got to him first and told him everything. I had to sit through my exam knowing Ryan hated me. As soon as I finished, I packed my stuff to go home, as I was sure I wouldn't win the scholarship now. Besides, I didn't want to be around Dee Dee or have to worry about bumping into Ryan. As I dragged my suitcase across the schoolyard, I found myself filled with feelings of regret, sadness, and I missed Ryan. Suddenly, I felt a hug from behind, a familiar scent, and warm voice whispered in my ear, I'm sorry I misunderstood you. I burst into tears. I turned back and squeezed him. It turned out that right after the exam, my amazing housemate Bella had found Ryan and explained it all to him. I feel so lucky to have such a lovely friend like her. I invited Ryan to come and visit my hometown. My mother was happy to see me bringing a boy home, and even though I told her we were just friends, I knew she didn't believe me, as the sparks between us were so obvious. She seemed very pleased and even whispered in my ear, Good choice, Addie. That night, Mom cooked steak and dauphinois potatoes as a treat for Ryan and me. We chatted happily, and Mom took a genuine interest in Ryan and his family. She asked him the usual questions, such as, What is your major? Where do you live? What do your parents do? But then, when Ryan said his father's name, Mom dropped her fork. She asked some more details, then the color drained from her face. I asked her if she was okay, and she made an excuse that she was a bit tired— so she told us to carry on eating and went to her room. That night, after I had made the bed up in the spare room for Ryan, I went to my mother's room to ask if she was feeling better. I saw her sitting there, staring out of the window and crying. I called, Mom, what's wrong with you? She looked straight at me, then slowly said, I'm so sorry, but you can't be with Ryan. This didn't make any sense to me. As earlier she told me how much she liked him, so I asked her, why is that, mom? 
You were all for him before. Then she gripped my hand as she told me the shocking truth. Ryan's father was the man who made my father's company bankrupt and resulted in him taking his own life. It's impossible. It can't be like that. Watching the tears rolling down my mother's cheeks, I understood that even though it was heartbreaking, it was true. Ryan wasn't just the cute boy I had a crush on. He's also my family's enemy's son. That night, I couldn't sleep. How could things be so coincidental? Our love was just sprouting, and now it was in a situation that was no different from Romeo and Juliet's. I knew it wasn't Ryan's fault that his dad was a heartless businessman, but at the same time, how could I continue to see a boy who I knew was the son of the man who caused my dad to end his life? Also, there was no way his parents would ever accept me if they knew my true identity. I didn't know how to tell Ryan the truth. I mean, it's not like I could just come out and tell him straight that his dad was basically a murderer. No, I didn't want to hurt Ryan like that. The next morning, Ryan left in a rush as his dad called him saying there was some kind of emergency. He kissed me goodbye and I felt my heart ache. Not only was it our first kiss, but I knew it also had to be our last. He said he'd see me at college and I mumbled out a, yeah, sure. I didn't have enough money for college. Well, there was no way I could afford going back. I sulked around the house feeling miserable. Then, to my surprise, the college called me and told me I had got the scholarship. This was such a shock for me, and as fortunate as I felt, I also felt sad. This meant I wouldn't be able to avoid Ryan. Instead, I'd have to face the boy I liked every day, knowing I would be betraying my father's memory if I stayed with him. Ryan said he'd pick me up from the airport. I was so nervous. In fact, the fear that I wouldn't be able to suppress my emotions when I met him filled me. As I waited for him, suddenly my phone popped up a line. Darling, I'm sorry. I can't come and pick you up. Things are very urgent right now and I need to stay here and help my dad solve the company's problems. I will try to come home as soon as possible. I miss you and look forward to seeing you. I felt so down, but it was good. I wouldn't have to feel so awkward about seeing him anymore. When I was waiting at the bus stop, I met this guy called Junsu. Turns out he had just arrived from Korea and was studying at the same college as me. He looked very awkward, just like when I first came here. I offered to lead the way back to college because I was heading there too. Two weeks later and Ryan still hadn't returned to college, and I didn't receive any messages from him. Although this saddened me, I tried to convince myself that it was for the best. I returned to my part-time restaurant job. My boss told me there was a new guy starting, so it was my job to show him what to do. She then introduced me to... Jun Su. Turns out, he was the new staff member. Everyone in the restaurant kept teasing me that Jun Su liked me. Even Bella said so. I didn't know if it was real or not because I had always focused on studying and working. Either way, it didn't matter, as my heart still pined for Ryan. Then one day, after school, while I was thinking randomly, my footsteps led me to Ryan's house. Three scary-looking people were standing outside the mansion, and there was a for-sale sign on the gate. What's happening? I started to worry. Why hadn't Ryan messaged me? Where was he right now? I stood there for a moment, and then I took out my phone and scrolled to his name, but I couldn't bring myself to call him. When I was in trouble, Ryan was always there, helping and loving me, but now I couldn't do anything to help him. The realization hit me just how much I loved and missed him. I ended up walking to the city park and slumped down on the lawn near the lake where Ryan and I used to study together. I started crying. That's when Jun Su appeared. Turned out he came here often to go for a picnic. He came sitting next to me and passed me a glass of soju and some tasty dried meats. This drink is incredible. If it can't cheer you up, then nothing can. He smiled at me. He was such a sweet guy, and I appreciated his kindness. I was still crying as I drank the soju. Then I ended up spilling all my feelings out to Junsu. He was such a good listener, and he didn't seem to mind that I was crying into his shirt. Then suddenly I looked up and saw a familiar shape standing over me. It was Ryan. 
At first I had to pinch myself. Had the wine gone to my head and caused me to imagine him? I let go of Junsu and jumped up to rub my eyes to see clearly. It really was Ryan. He was standing there, looking surprised and extremely angry. Then he turned away and I chased after him, but because I was a bit drunk, I fell to the ground. I tried shouting out to him that it wasn't what it looked like, but he chose to ignore me. I had no choice but to lay there on the ground and watch the boy I loved with all my heart walking away from me. Right now, it all seems so complicated. Stay tuned for the final part in my saga. Trust me, you won't want to miss it. Hi everyone, my name's Maya. I just turned 17, and today I want to tell you the story which will seriously haunt me for the rest of my life. Let me start from the beginning. My family and I come from Germany, but we decided to move to Chicago in America. I was pretty nervous about it because I'd never been there before, but it turns out it's actually a pretty awesome city. We quickly settled into our new house, and before I knew it, my parents had decided to sign me up for the local school. I really didn't want to go, because back in Germany, I'd been bullied. The other kids thought I was a loser, and they did mean things to me. One time, I was pushed into a puddle, and someone kept stealing my homework. Then, the worst thing of all was when I sat on my seat and someone had left a brownie there. So when I stood up, it looked like I'd pooped myself. I was so upset, and so this was why I wasn't keen to start at a new school. What if it was as bad as my school in Germany? Well, I didn't have much choice, and soon, my new school life in Chicago began. On the first day, I introduced myself to my new classmates. I was expecting them to completely mock me like my old classmates, but thankfully, they didn't. They were actually surprisingly nice, and my math teacher, Mr. Jones, was such a nice guy. He started helping me with my math problems and always gave me lots of attention, making sure I was okay. He was an amazing teacher, but eventually, I started getting weird vibes from him. One time, I caught him staring at me with this creepy grin on his face. Another time, when I was sitting through an exam, he kept standing behind my back, and I felt like he was sniffing my hair. At some point, he even touched my lower back as he told me to sit up straight. It was really uncomfortable, but I stayed put since I didn't want to cause a mess during the test. Then it got worse, when one day, I dropped my pencil and bent over to pick it up. He came up to me and whispered, You know, Maya, you should wear a mini skirt like the other girls. It would look great on you. I mean, who would say something like that to their student? I didn't reply to him. I just grabbed my things and walked out. Luckily, class was over, and it was lunchtime, so I went straight to the canteen and tried to forget about what Mr. Jones had just said to me. But as soon as I sat down, three girls approached me, and one of them said, Beat it, new girl! This is our spot! I couldn't believe it. So I replied, No, sorry, I was here first. Find yourself another place to sit. Well, you should have seen her face. She got so mad and started pulling my hair. I was screaming in pain. And suddenly, I heard someone shouting behind me. Hey, leave her alone, will you? Or do you want me to come over there and pull your hair? Let's see how you like it. The mean girl let go of me and walked off. And the girl who saved me ran over and said, Hey, are you okay? I told her I was fine. And after that, we became best friends. Her name is Mona, and she's the bravest person I've ever met. She's the same age as me, but she's not afraid of anything or anyone. I wish I could be more like her. Once, I plucked up the courage to tell her what had been happening with Mr. Jones. Mona wasn't surprised because she said she'd noticed how weird he was acting and that last year, she'd actually caught him spying on some girls in the locker room. So she believed me and knew he wasn't a good guy, but sadly, she didn't have any proof of what he'd done. One afternoon, when we were walking home, I suddenly felt really anxious, almost like someone was following us. I told Mona I wanted to get home quickly, and we basically ran the rest of the way. When I got home, I told my parents about what had happened at school and on the way home. And do you know what they said? My mom said, Maya, you're such a drama queen. There's no way your teacher would do that. And why would anyone follow you? It was probably just a neighbor. And then my dad said, Go to your room. Don't tell lies just for attention, Maya. I couldn't believe my parents. How could they think I'd make something like that up? 
I was so upset. I skipped dinner and stayed in my room for the rest of the night. I eventually fell asleep, but at 3 a.m., I woke up. There was some kind of tapping noise that had woken me up, and I had no idea what it was. I went to check on my parrot, Lemon, thinking maybe she'd escaped out of her cage, but Lemon was fast asleep in her cage. So, where was that noise coming from then? I opened the curtains to check, and that's when I saw a shadowy figure. I got such a fright and screamed so loud, I woke up my parents. They came running to my room, and my mom said, What's wrong, honey? I was so scared I could barely speak and only managed to stutter, There, there's someone at my window. I pointed outside to show my parents, but by then, the figure was gone. I didn't understand it. It had just been there. My dad turned to me and said, Come on, Maya, go back to bed. You probably just had a nightmare. Then they went back to their room and left me alone. But I did see something. It wasn't just a nightmare. Someone was following me, and I was going to find out exactly who it was. The next day, I told Mona about what had happened, and she was so worried. She said there were lots of weirdos in this town, and I had to be careful. After school that day, I decided to stay behind and ask Mr. Jones for help with my homework. Even though he'd been acting creepy, I decided maybe my parents were right, and maybe I'd just misunderstood him. Plus, I really needed his help on this, or else I might fail the upcoming test. And to be safe, Mona was right outside waiting for me, so if he tried anything, I could just scream for her to help me. I went to his classroom, but he wasn't there, so I decided to wait for him to come back. While I was waiting, though, I spotted something on his desk. I took a closer look and couldn't believe what I was seeing. There were three pictures of me sitting there. One was of me practicing my cheerleading. Another was of me watching TV in my living room. And the third was of me in the shower. I knew I should have shut the blinds when I was showering the other day. Oh my gosh, it all makes sense now. Mr. Jones was stalking me. He'd followed me home and knew where I lived. This was a disaster. I took a photo of the pictures and sent them to Mona. She called me straight away and said, I knew it. My dad's a police officer, so I'll call him and he'll be here right away. But then I heard footsteps, so I hung up. Someone was coming in. It was Mr. Jones. As soon as he saw me holding the photos, he started doing that creepy smile again. So, you finally figured it out. He said, You know, I have a bit of a thing for German girls. Lucky me that I get to be around you every day. He was walking towards me, and I had no way of escaping. I tried to run past him, but he caught me and pushed me against the wall. I started crying and said, No! No! Please, leave me alone! But he wouldn't let go. He tried to make a move on me, but I managed to kick him where it hurt most, and then I shoved him in the ribs with my school bag. He fell over, and I used that as my chance to escape. I made it out the door, and by that point, I was screaming for help. But Mr. Jones started chasing me. I have never run so fast in my life. And just as I turned the corner, the police arrived. The principal was also there, and so were my parents. Thank God. Perfect timing. I thanked Mona for saving me, because if it hadn't been for her, I dread to think what could have happened to me. My parents apologized for not believing me sooner. They felt so bad, and of course, Mr. Jones got sentenced to 30 years in prison. During the court case, he admitted to having assaulted 12 other girls over the past five years, which is why he got such a long sentence. If you ask me, he should have gotten even longer, though. After that, I became a hero at my new school, and all the other girls were so grateful to me for getting him sentenced. And now that he's locked up, life at school is a lot more comfortable and I actually enjoy it more than I thought, especially since I always have my best friend Mona beside me. My name's Faith. I'm 16, and it was always just me and my mom. I don't know much about my dad. Actually, I've never met him. All I know is that my mom really loved him. When she told him she was pregnant with me, he confessed that he was married and then abandoned us both. Mom moved to the suburbs and brought me up alone. I love to dance but mom couldn't afford dance lessons, so I taught myself by watching online videos. Mom loved watching me dance. Seeing her look so proud made me feel proud too. Then, something awful happened. When I got to high school, my mom got in a car accident, and she passed away. So, I went to live with my mom's sister, Aunt Clarabelle. Then I started my new school. Everything was new and strange. 
In class, my teacher told me to sit next to this pretty girl called Anita. I smiled at her, but she just laughed and made fun of my backpack. For the rest of the day, Anita made snide comments toward me, and all her friends looked over at me and laughed. I felt so alone. It was horrible. That evening, I tried to release my frustration through dance. My aunt walked in and saw me spinning in the living room. She seemed pretty impressed and told me she'd sign me up for the dancing center in town. I was so excited, as this meant I'd finally get professional lessons. In my first session, I walked in to see Anita there. It turns out she's also a dancer. On seeing me, she said, Oh no, not another loser. All the other girls laughed, but I tried my best to ignore her, as I was here to learn. I noticed how all the other girls at school gathered around Anita and stuck to her every word. I wasn't sure why this was. Were they afraid of her? If any girls dared to question her, she'd say mean things about them. I once saw her chuck one girl's phone in the bush because she hesitated when Anita asked her something. My school life got better, as I made friends with this girl called Rian. One weekend, one of Rian's friends was having a party, so she invited me along too. Anita was also at the party, and it wasn't long before she announced a battle dance game. Everyone just stepped back to two sides and revealed an empty place in the center, and then the music played. Anita began to dance first, and when it was the other side's turn, everyone looked at each other, and suddenly, Rian pushed me into that space. At first, I stood there confused, but after being cheered by everyone on my side, I danced. Everyone applauded, and Anita stormed off in a huff. After that, kids I didn't know started talking to me. I didn't feel like such a loser anymore, and it was all thanks to Rian and my love of dance. I guess Anita saw it as me stealing her limelight, and she didn't like it one bit. So, she started playing mean tricks on me. One day, during a basketball lesson, Anita and some of her friends threw a ball towards me while I was walking out from the toilet. Fortunately, Cameron, this really cute guy, leaped up and caught the ball. Then he asked me if I was alright. I looked over at Anita. She was so mad. I figured that she probably had a crush on Cameron, as most girls do. When school finished, I went to the parking lot and found both my bike tires punctured. I started to panic, as I didn't know what to do. Then Anita and her friends walked past. She had the biggest grin on her face. That's when Cameron came to the rescue. He took me home on his motorbike and even offered to pick me up the next day. After this, Cameron and I started hanging out a lot. The problem was, the more time I spent with him, the worse Anita became. She stuck gum on my chair, which ruined my skirt, and meant I had to walk around with my sweater tied around my waist all day, even though it was cold. She hid my backpack so I had no books or anything in class. She laughed and pointed at me every time I passed her. I remained calm and didn't show any anger towards her. I didn't care about Anita. She was just a mean and jealous girl. Cameron and I started dating, and then we became an official item. For the first time in a long time, I was actually happy. Then, the most anticipated event of the year finally came. A talent show was taking place for kids in the area, and my school held auditions to find the best acts to represent them. With encouragement from Cameron and Rian, I found the confidence to sign up. And of course, Anita signed up too. I had practiced hard for the auditions, but then, an unwanted incident happened. Do you know what? Someone had stolen my dancing shoes right before my turn to perform. That day, when I was warming up in the dressing room behind the stage, Cameron called, saying he was outside with a drink for me. You're so sweet, I said to Cameron. Then I noticed that Anita was smirking at me from the next chair. I just ignored her and ran to get my drink. But as soon as I returned, I couldn't find my dancing shoes anywhere. Panicking, I frantically searched for them. But nope, they'd gone. Then, the judges called my name. Shoes or no shoes, my performance had to happen. So, I went out there barefoot and began to dance. A few minutes into it, one of the judges stopped the music. I thought they were going to tell me I wasn't good enough. But no, instead, they asked Anita to lend me her dancing shoes. Needless to say, Anita looked very annoyed. After the dance, I returned Anita's shoes to her and said thanks, but she growled at me, then stormed off. I bet that she was the one who stole my shoes. Although I lost my dancing shoes, I got the talent competition place. Needless to say, Anita was super mad. For the whole week, she was constantly shouting at people. I kind of felt bad for her close friends. Anyway, it was none of my business. I didn't have time to think of her. I needed to prepare for my performance. 
For the next few weeks, I practiced whenever I could. Cameron was so supportive and helped me the best he could. Finally, the contest day arrived, so we took the bus there. Anita and her friends sat on the same row as us. She tried to flirt with Cameron even though he didn't care about her at all. And when the bus went around the corner, she even pretended to fall onto Cameron's lap, then touched his chest. Talk about shamelessness. When we arrived there, it was so busy with heaps of kids from other schools. I began to tremble and tried my best to control my breathing. There were a total of 15 performances selected for the final round, and all other contestants were very talented. After the welcome and introduction ceremony, the performances began. Nervously, I was the final contestant. Walking onto the stage, I greeted the audience and started. The performance was going well, really well. Then suddenly, darkness! Everyone was noisy, and I stood there still and bewildered. People said that someone must have done something with the power lines and caused a power cut. I was very confused and didn't know what to do. Then suddenly, about three minutes later, the headlights from two cars shone on either side of the stage, illuminating me. Then I saw Cameron, Rian, and some of their friends were in the cars. Suddenly, Cameron ran to the stage and carried a mini- <laughs> I was really touched at that moment. I guess I impressed the judges as, guess what? I won first place! Right after the awarding ceremony, I went down and hugged Cameron and Rian. I had the best boyfriend and friends in the world, and I was so grateful. After that, I entered the dressing room and found Anita crying. I asked her if she was okay, but this only made her cry even more. She sobbed out and pushed me. Why is it always you? Why are you so lucky? Why do people all like you, not me? I replied, Anita, sorry. I did nothing to you. I just let everything go as it is. Tell me what happened to you. Then she looked at me in tears and said, It's me. I cut the power. I wanted to ruin your performance, but I only made it even more amazing. I asked her, Why would you do that? And she replied, Because ever since you showed up, I felt like a nobody. You're a better dancer than me, and Cameron likes you, not me. I know many people would have been mad at her, but I just felt sorry for her. So I sat down next to her and gave her a hug and said, You're an amazing dancer. I wish I could do the twist and punch like you can. Yeah, I am pretty good at that, aren't I? After a while, she managed to smile. I really am sorry for everything. Now, Anita and I are friends. We often practice dance routines together, and at the end of the term shows, we even perform together. Guys, adversity is the mother of wisdom. We should never be pessimistic when facing difficult situations. Let's try our best to overcome it. The results will not disappoint you. Hello, everybody. I'm Caitlin. My short height and young looks may make me look like a kid, but appearances can be deceptive. I'm actually 34 years old. I know it sounds crazy but it's all down to my super rare condition called Turner Syndrome. It's a disease that only females have. It means I only have one X chromosome, and as a result, it means I look far younger than I am. And I'm in the same height as your average 11-year-old. So even though I'm an adult, I pass for a kid. You may think this sounds great. Sure, I can go crazy in a candy store without raising suspicion, but other than that, looking way younger than I am is hard to live with. I'm the oldest of three kids. My bro Jeremy and sis Dela may be younger than me, but because of my condition, they both look older than me and they tower above me. I'm gonna take you back to when I was 16 and my parents noticed that not only did I look younger than Dela, but I was shorter than her too. I told myself it was nothing. I was just a slow developer, that's all. But my mom thought otherwise. So she dragged me to seven different doctors. 
Then voila, one of them diagnosed me with Turner syndrome. Naturally, neither me nor my family had ever heard of this condition before. I mean, come on, a disease that makes someone stay young forever? It sounds like something out of a movie. Relax, I'm not dying or anything, but it does mean I'll never look like an adult. I realize people spend a bunch of money to look young, yet here I am, doing it without even having to try. But trust me, looking like a little kid when you're not one can be problematic. For instance, high school was a nightmare. I had this one friend, called Alice. At first, we were pretty inseparable, but as time passed and she aged and I didn't, she began to single me out and join the other girls in making fun of me. They pretended to make baby crying noises when I walked past them, and one of them even put a baby doll in my locker with a picture of my face stuck to it. I stopped being friends with Alice after that, and watched on with sadness as other girls my age started dating boys, but no guy ever noticed me. Like seriously, they literally didn't notice me, especially the tall ones. And for the few that looked down and saw me, well, they made corny jokes like, Hey Caitlin, how's the weather down there? And, someone better call kindergarten as they're missing a kid. However bad the teasing got, Dela and Jeremy were always there for me. From cheering me up when I felt down, to passing me the cookie jar off the top shelf. I may be small, but I'm determined. So I made it to college and ended up qualifying as a teacher. On my first day of my new job, I was extremely nervous, but I reassured myself that I could do this. On seeing me for the first time, my students were surprised and clearly confused. One of them spoke and said, Excuse me, little girl, are you lost or something? Where's your mommy? Wow, the nerve of that girl. As if she just said that. I decided to take a deep breath and said, No, I'm your teacher. I may look like an 11-year-old child, but I assure you that I'm not. They all snorted and laughed, and one kid said, Yeah, right. So I passed my ID card around the class. I couldn't help but smile as one at a time they looked down at my ID with shocked faces. Priceless. During my first class, I taught my students about Turner Syndrome so they could understand it. After that, they were respectful toward me. Apart from this one boy who clearly viewed himself as the class clown, then he said, you know, maybe next time you should wear a chipmunk outfit or maybe an elf costume because that will totally fit you. The whole class laughed. So I gave him four weeks detention. I can assure you there was no laughter after that, nor did anyone make any comments about my condition again. One lunchtime, I was sitting in the staff room when the science teacher named Henry came over and sat next to me. Then he smiled and said, hey, how's your first week going? talk about handsome? My legs instantly felt like a jelly. We started talking about my condition and he was very sweet about it. I don't mind. I studied Turner syndromes before. It's okay because I like you. It's who you are. His words made my heart flutter. He was so sincere and kind. We started hanging out more and then we started dating. Don't tell anyone, but sometimes I found him so irresistible that I couldn't resist kissing him in the janitor's closet. Of course, my condition caused us some problems. One time Henry and I were in a bar. I asked the bartender if I could have some vodka. He said, sorry kiddo, you're too young to have some alcohol. Even when I showed him my ID, he still wouldn't serve me. Unbelievable. Another time we were kissing on a bench in the park. It was so romantic. Until some old lady screamed at us, you sick pervert, how can you kiss a little girl? To make it even more awful, Two police officers showed up and I had to explain myself to them and show them my ID. Luckily, they believed me, and Henry wasn't arrested, but the old woman continued to give Henry dirty looks. Then, just when I thought things couldn't get any more awkward, we popped into the grocery store. Henry had just passed me the cereal, which I was too short to reach, when I heard someone behind me say, Caitlin, is that you? Oh boy, I recognized that voice. I turned around and, yep, it was my old childhood friend, Alice. She smirked and said, Wow, you haven't changed a bit, but I'm not surprised. You never change. I replied, Don't you have somewhere else to be? I'm hanging out with my boyfriend. She gave a shocked look as she looked at Henry. Wait, you're dating her? Isn't she, um... A bit on the short side for you. 
He just shrugged and told her, I don't care what you think of her, as she's the most amazing woman I've ever met. She flicked her hair and replied, Why don't you date someone your own size? I mean, look at me. I'm beyond sexy. Yeah, from space, I rolled my eyes. Everyone in the store started laughing at her. Now look who's embarrassed. You know what they say, payback's a... Well, you know the rest. Regardless of all this drama, Henry stuck by my side and continued to support me. He even arranged for our families to meet. We met up in a restaurant. When Henry's parents saw me, they were kind of surprised. His mom greeted me with a hug, but his dad just glared at me. My parents keep asking Henry questions while Dayla and Jeremy chatted with Henry's twin sisters about sports. Things were going fine until out of nowhere, Henry's dad slammed his hand on the table and said, I can't take this anymore. You shouldn't date my son. He's too good for you. Your shortness is going to ruin his life. I tried to keep composed, but inside this hurt more than I can possibly express into words. Henry stepped in and said, That's enough, Dad. You can't treat people like that just because they're different. Shame on you. Then he got down on one knee and took a ring out of his pocket. Caitlin, I love you, and I always will. So will you do me the great honor of becoming my wife? At first, I was speechless. But then I found my words and said, Yes, 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 I will marry you. I was crying with joy, and my family and his mom were clapping and hugging each other. But then Henry's dad shook his head in disgust. Then he stormed off. On our wedding day, Henry's dad refused to show up. I felt so bad for Henry, but he told me we shouldn't let his dad's bad choice ruin our perfect day. I was about to walk down the aisle when his dad burst into the room. Oh no, was he going to ruin the wedding? Everyone was staring at him, and I thought I was going to collapse from the shock of it all. But then he said, I'm sorry for how I acted. It was wrong of me to judge you on your condition. I would very much like to be here for your wedding if you'll have me. I cried out, yes, of course, take a seat. Our wedding day was magical, and so was our life together. Things are still going well for Henry and me, and I'm now the happiest I've ever been. I may have the appearance of a child, and yes, my condition is never going to go away. But my life as an adult is amazing, and this is all thanks to the remarkable people I have in my life. I'm so fortunate to have them supporting me. And with them by my side, I'm able to find my inner strength and conquer any obstacles that get in my way, however big they may be. Hey guys, it's Jackson here, again. I'm just your average guy. Well, at least I was until Sally, the hottest girl in my entire school, asked me out. Yeah, it came to a shock to me too. At first, it was going pretty well between Sally and me. Then, things changed. Turns out she's Zodiac obsessed. Like, seriously. She bases her life decisions on what's written in the stars. (laughs) Crazy, huh? I put up with this because I like her. Only, she took it way too far when she demanded I have a baby with her as soon as possible so it'd be a Sagittarius. If not, then she'd go sleep with some Libra dude instead. It was really hard for me to convince her that we were still too young to give birth and raise a baby, but she still insisted on the idea. Well, I'm not the kind of boy who's good at comforting angry girlfriends. So things became a cold war between us. Until one day when my neighbor Safi came over to bring us some food. She realized I was tired after a huge fight on the phone with Sally. Then she asked me what the situation was between us. I shrugged and said we were still good. And that was when she said that she knew that I'd always be suffering staying with Sally. Then she confessed that she had a huge crush on me. And I'd be better with her instead of my nasty girl. Oh, Jesus. I didn't see that one coming. It was bad enough having Sally issues without Safi being weird toward me too. I knew that if Sally found out about this, she'd freak out. She hated Safi because she knew Safi is a Gemini. The same Zodiac as her. She had this crazy theory I'd end up developing a stronger connection with Safi over her. It could be a battlefield here. At first, I put Safi's crush down to her age, as she was three years younger than me. Which is why she confessed her feelings to me. I grinned at her and said, no worries, you're just a kid, so it's normal for you to admire me. I guess I'm like your big brother. She looked a little embarrassed, which made me feel sorry. I told her she was an awesome friend. 
and that was when she said, Okay, I'm happier to start as a friend than a little sister. She winked at me, and then her flirting plan began. One night, Safi showed up with Chinese takeout and insisted me watch a movie with her. Suddenly, she began stroking my arm just as Sally walked in with pizza, saw what was going on, and threw the entire box at me. Then the Zodiac theory started up again. Sally said that she knew it from the start that love was just a game for me and that the Gemini slut would steal me from her. Safi started shouting at Sally and said she was a terrible girlfriend and that I deserved to be with someone better, someone like her. They were literally pulling at each other's hair and wiping slices of greasy pizza all over each other's faces. I tried to stand between to stop them and take all the hits myself until not a slice of pizza but a reed diffuser jar was thrown right to my head and caused essential water inside to cover me. The two dropped whatever they were holding in their hands and rushed to me. They kept touching me and trying to show their care for me, and I just had to leave them to it. Now I had two sassy girls battling over me, and I was stuck in the middle. I couldn't work out if this was flattering or terrifying. It was obvious that they were both competing to show how deep their love for me was. Safi often showed up with food and said sweet things to me. I mean, come on, who was I to turn down free food? While Sally kept filling my social media pages with lovey-dovey pics of us together. In one of them, I was blushing as she kissed my cheek. Talk about cringeworthy. Safi retaliated by adding pics of us as kids. It didn't help that these pictures got double the likes that Sally's did. I tried reassuring Sally that I loved her and that Safi was just a kid. But I guess Sally felt threatened as she began to resort back to her old ways. Once I walked into the room and found her flicking through a baby magazine. When I mentioned it, she got really defensive and told me she was merely looking at the adverts. Then one time she was watching a romantic movie. She stayed after the film finished and began twirling her hair, then touching my leg. Then she said, that movie made me realize how important life is. You know, our baby would be the cutest, don't you think? Come on! And she leaned in to kiss me. Luckily, Safi pressed the doorbell. Saved by the bell, whew! She just wanted to borrow my headphones, but this was enough for Sally to give up for now, and she went home in a mood. One time when Sally was in my room, I overheard her on a video call to Safi, telling her that we were planning on having a baby together. So she should be respectable and had better stay away if she couldn't give birth at that age. What? This was madness. Since when did they have video conversations? And since when did having a kid with me become a competition? I didn't want to have a baby. It got worse. As I heard Safi say, she wouldn't use a baby as a trap, but if Sally still insisted on doing this, she would implement her own plan so I couldn't have children anymore. The color drained from me. OMG, what were they planning on doing to me? I tried to convince myself Safi was just a kid, so what harm could she do? Turns out she could, in fact, do a lot of mischief. One time when I was about to drink grape juice from the fridge, Sally stormed into the kitchen and hit me on the back so hard that I spewed it all out of my mouth. Then she poured all the grape juice down the sink. She told me that Safi had just slipped out to her, saying she'd mixed a potion in there so I could never have kids. Safi denied it and said it was regular grape juice. And Sally refused to show me the messages, which she claimed Safi used psychic powers to delete. I have to admit, I didn't believe Sally. I mean, hello, the whole potion thing sounded bonkers. Then my mom's party happened. Mom invited our neighbors, so Safi was there. And, of course, Sally came to join us. After cake, Sally pulled me up to my room. Oh my god, I already knew what she was trying to do. She kissed me intensely and had her hands all over me. It took a lot of effort for me to control myself and push her away, but she whispered in my ear that she had given up her baby plan. Then she pulled out a box of condoms from her pocket. Suddenly, my closet door opened to reveal Safi sitting in there. She rushed out and snatched the condom box from Sally's hand and said, I watched her poke them with a needle. This is all her sick idea of tricking you, and I'm putting a stop to it. Naturally, this made Sally super mad. She screamed at Safi that she was a sick weirdo for spying on us. Safi just smirked and said that she just performed a ritual in my room so I wouldn't be able to have children with Sally anymore. Suddenly, I smelled something burning. Smoke was coming out of my closet. I opened it to see a fire in the corner. I was about to run out to get water, but Safi grabbed my arm to stop me and shouted something about how if I did that, the talisman would be ineffective because her psychic said she had to let it burn until the fire burns itself out. 
I pushed her away and ran out of there. I returned to find the door locked from the inside. I could hear both girls arguing inside, and I saw smoke coming from the gap in the door. My parents ran up and helped me bang on the door, but those girls were having none of it. Forget the fire. The scariest sight by far was happening next to the window. The two girls were grabbing each other's hair, at the same time fighting and trying to hang their heads out of the window to be able to breathe. My parents rushed in to pull them out, and they eventually saw sense, although they did insult each other as they were being pulled out. Now I'm pretty famous in my town. Everyone knows me as that firehouse guy, and how I'm so desirable that two girls ignore the fact that their lives were in danger to fight over me. <laughs> Great. Also, I lost pretty much all my stuff in that fire. I'm currently not talking to either of them. Safi's tried apologizing. One time I actually jumped into a bush to avoid her. As for Sally, I'm ignoring all of her calls. Those damn girls. I'm sure they'll be the death of me. Hi, I'm Lola, and like any typical teenager, I was always asking my parents for some pocket money, but they always said no. It's not that they were poor or anything. They just thought I was too young and irresponsible to have my own money. Silly, right? So, I had to take matters into my own hands. I couldn't just go out and get a part-time job, because I was only 15, so I googled some other options. One girl had written that she made good money from flirting with older men, but who was I fooling? I could never do that. I have self-respect. It just wasn't fair. All my friends at school had enough to cover their lunch and snacks and stuff, and even had some money left over to go to the mall and buy all the latest clothes. But not me. I was stuck in old clothes that had gone out of fashion years ago, and it was so embarrassing. And this had to change. There had to be a way. And then I found it. I was going to join the Illuminati. Yep, you heard me right. A powerful organization which is supposed to be secretly controls the entire modern world, probably while wearing cloaks, you know, infiltrating the media, brainwashing everybody somehow, I don't really even know if they are real or not, but anyways. Basically, it all started when I put a message on my Facebook, asking if anyone had any ideas about how I could make some money. Well, five minutes later, I got a message from my ex. We only dated for a few weeks, because he broke up with me for a girl from another school, and I swear it's because I dressed so badly and had no money. I hadn't spoken to him since then, so I was surprised to see him pop up in my inbox. He told me about how I could join the Illuminati to be able to get some benefits from them. He said it was really exclusive, but he was in, and that was how he got allowance to afford everything he wanted. Then he asked me if we could meet up, and he'd tell me more. I immediately said yes, even though he'd broken my heart when he dumped me. I mean, that's how badly I wanted money. I was willing to meet up with my ex for it. And you will not believe it. He arrived at my house in a Porsche. I asked him if it was his dad's, and he said no, it was his. He'd bought it himself, and that was just one of his membership benefits. Then he asked if I wanted to join, and if I was serious, and all I could look at was his fancy clothes and sports car. I used to date him, and I know his family was not wealthy. He definitely bought it himself, and now he looked just rich enough to not worry about how much things cost, and I was like, Yes, sign me up. But he said there were some things I need to do before I became an official member, and that he'd send me a list later that day. So he sent me the list, and the first thing he asked me to do was to burn cockroaches alive. I mean, where would I even find cockroaches? I am literally the cleanest person you will ever meet, and so are my family. So there wasn't a chance there was even one sneaky cockroach hiding anywhere in our house. It killed me a little, realizing that I'd need to become messy so that cockroaches would start coming into my room. I started by leaving dirty plates under my bed. After two days of rotting fish lying under my bed, I honestly thought I was going to puke. And things just kept getting worse. Two weeks later, I swear my room looked and smelled worse than a trash can. And that's when the cockroaches started coming. One day, I came home from school, and they were everywhere. I started collecting them, and before my parents got home from work, I turned the stove on the highest temperature and popped them in the fire. I didn't even dare to watch them burn. It devastated me to know I was hurting them. 
But what choice did I have? I had to get approved to join the Illuminati. I made a video and sent it to my ex, and he said he'd forward it to the head of the society. In the meantime, I went to even more desperate measures to get some money. I have really short hair, so I can often pass as a boy, even though I'm a girl. Some people even think I'm a lesbian, so I decided to play along with it. I started to hang out with a few girls from school who were all lesbians, and I couldn't believe they were actually interested in me. I felt kind of bad. I mean, I didn't actually like them, I just wanted their money. Soon, they were buying me lunch every day, so that meant I could start saving up the money my parents gave me for lunch. But honestly, I just felt empty. I realized those girls felt sorry for me and saw me as some kind of charity case. So, after a while, I moved on from them and started dating a guy called Sandy. He was pretty cute, and I never thought he'd be the kind of guy to like me. And at first, things were great. But one day, he asked me for money so he could buy data for his phone. I said okay, but I quickly regretted it because then he started asking me for other things, like a new t-shirt, a cap, and then at lunchtime, he would just expect me to buy his lunch. But I never did. I always told him I didn't have enough money, even though I did have a little bit saved up. But I'd worked hard for that and wasn't about to spend it on him. After a while, he started treating me badly, and so it came as no surprise when he broke up with me. I didn't even care. He'd become a bit of a burden anyway. By then, it had been like a month, so I messaged my ex to ask if I'd been accepted yet. He just wrote back, laugh out loud, not yet. You need to kill two rats, then they'll properly consider you. I couldn't believe it. I cried so much killing cockroaches, so how would I be able to kill two rats? I replied to him and said, forget it. This was a dumb idea. I can't do it. I'm not joking when I say that literally five minutes later, my friend messaged me and told me to go on Instagram. There was my video of me killing the cockroaches, and underneath it said, hashtag cockroach killer. He'd even taken screenshots of the video and made a collage of all my different facial expressions as I killed them. I couldn't believe it. What was he doing? Was this some kind of prank? And then another video popped up in my inbox. It was from him. He was speaking in it and said that he was never actually in the Illuminati. He just wanted to have a bit of fun and didn't think I'd actually be so gullible to believe him. Then he said it wasn't even his Porsche. He just borrowed it from his friend's dad and that he only managed to buy fancy clothes because he made money from his poetry gigs that he did every weekend. And then he just started laughing saying that I was crazy and he was glad he'd broken up with me. And what kind of person would actually be dumb enough to think that they could just join the Illuminati by killing cockroaches? Oh my god, why had I believed him? I felt so sad hearing him say all those nasty things about me. Pretty soon, that video went viral, and everyone at school saw it. Eventually, Instagram took it down. But it'll haunt me forever. The boys at school still laugh at me and call me the cockroach killer, especially Sandy. He is like my biggest enemy now, along with my ex. They were so mean to me, but weirdly enough, none of the girls laughed at me. In fact, the lesbian girls actually stuck by me and supported me, and it made me feel so bad for using them. They genuinely wanted to be my friend. You're probably wondering if I actually managed to make any extra money? Nope. I'd say I'm even poorer now because my guilt won't allow me to let my friends buy me lunch, even when they offer. And of course, my parents are still as stingy as ever. Things are even worse now, as after the whole cockroach thing, they thought I'd gone a bit crazy, and even installed a security system at home so they could keep an eye on me. So, not only do I have no money, I have no privacy either. And it's all because I stupidly believed the Illuminati could change my life for the better. Yeah, right. Guess I'll just need to wait until I'm a bit older and can get a proper job and not rely on others. Hi again, it's me, Amanda. In the first part of my story, my mom went to prison and I ended up in an orphanage. Two families attempted to adopt me, but both failed miserably. And then third time lucky, I met James. He adopted me, and we hit it off immediately. 
but then I started to develop inappropriate feelings for him. Everything was going great until Rosa, the new neighbor, turned up and started flirting with him. Now I'm jealous, and I need to find a way to tell James how I feel. I couldn't take it anymore, so I went to my best friend Juana's house. She'd been my best friend ever since I'd ended up in the orphanage, and now she lived with her adoptive parents just two streets from my house. I told Juana how I was feeling about James, and how I thought maybe he felt the same about me, but then I explained how Rosa was getting in between us now. She was so supportive, and said I should tell him soon before anything happened between him and Rosa. I had been so nervous about telling him, but after she encouraged me, I suddenly had the courage. That weekend, we were going to the park together, and I was going to tell him then. I ended up staying quite late at Juana's house. We had dinner together, and even drank some wine. By the time I got home, I was feeling a little tipsy. I was excited to see James, but I couldn't find him anywhere. I thought maybe he was working late, so I went to my room to lie down. As I went to close my curtains, I saw something outside. It was James, and he wasn't alone. He was with Rosa. I kept watching them, and suddenly, Rosa got really close to him and gave him a kiss on the cheek. I felt like I was going to explode with jealousy. Did James like her? I had to do something. I knew I wasn't thinking straight because I was kind of drunk, but I couldn't just stand there and watch that woman steal him away from me. I saw him heading towards our house, so I stumbled down the stairs and ran to the front door. He opened the door, and I was ready. I rushed to grab him and started kissing him like mad. At first, he just froze. He didn't kiss me back. Then suddenly, he pushed me away and started shouting at me. Amanda, what do you think you're doing? I'm your adoptive dad, he said. I couldn't believe he was saying this. I said to him, but dad, I mean, James, I thought you felt the same way. You've been so nice to me. I just like you so much. In fact, I think I'm in love with you, and I know you feel the same. James looked like his eyes were going to pop out of his head. He started walking away from me and said, No, stop this. You've got it all wrong. I love you like a father loves his daughter. I didn't believe him, though. I ran straight over to him and started kissing him harder. Then I ran my hands down his shirt and tried to undo some of his buttons. But then I felt a strong slap on my cheek that made me so dizzy, I almost fell down. I looked at James in shock. Had he really just hit me? He looked shocked, too and immediately apologized and said he was sorry. He reached out to touch my cheek, where his hand had left a massive red mark, but I moved away from him. He wasn't the kind of man to do this kind of thing. This was all because of Rosa. I knew it. I burst into tears and ran out of the house. I didn't even know where I was going. I just kept walking, and subconsciously, my feet led me to the orphanage. I went inside, even though it was late and the woman working there came running up to me to check if I was okay. I burst into tears as soon as I saw them, and just stood there letting them hug me. They asked me if something bad had happened, but I couldn't even talk. I just cried and cried. That night, I slept at the orphanage and thought about everything that had happened since leaving there. I felt so awkward about what I'd done. Maybe it had been wrong to kiss James like that? The next morning, I woke up and said goodbye to the women at the orphanage. I decided it was time to head home and apologize for what I'd done the night before. But when I got home, the house was empty. In the living room, I found a note from James next to a photo of my mom and me. I could not believe what I was reading. James wrote, Amanda, there's something I need to tell you. I knew your mom. In fact, we used to date. I didn't know she was your mom until I found this photo of you and her in your desk drawer. I met her when we were 17, and we quickly fell in love. I was the typical goody-two-shoes kind of student, and your mom was the naughty rebel. But they say opposites attract, right? We had a passionate love affair. Then one day, your mom told me that she was pregnant. I'm sorry to admit this, but I freaked out. I asked her to get an abortion, but she refused. So I left her and went to study abroad. I've regretted it ever since. 
and when I got back from overseas, I tried to contact her, but I couldn't. So then I tried to forget about her, and got married, and started a new life. Then I read on, and it was even more shocking. It said, From the moment I saw you, you seemed familiar, and now I know it's because you really are my long-lost daughter. I need some space now, though, because what happened yesterday was really awkward, and I need to gather my thoughts. Please wait for me, though. I promise I'll be back soon. I was so stunned! Is this what I had been feeling? A special bond because he was actually my dad? Oh my god! I felt so embarrassed. I'd completely misunderstood my feelings. I sat there, trying to process everything I'd just read, when suddenly, the phone rang. It was the woman from the orphanage, and they said, My mom had come to get me! What? This was too much. In one day, my whole life had been flipped upside down. I ran back to the orphanage, but my mom had already left. I couldn't believe it. Luckily, she left a phone number, and I called her straight away asking her to meet me at a nearby coffee shop. After so many years, my mom had changed a lot. She was so much thinner, and her face looked more gentle. We ran towards each other, and both just started hugging and crying. I was speechless. I didn't realize how much I'd missed her until we were standing there holding each other. After about five minutes of hugging nonstop, I remembered there was something I wanted to ask her. I showed her a photo of James, and my mom was surprised to see this. I asked her if this was my dad, and my mom looked shocked. Then she just shook her head and asked me to sit down so she could tell me their love story. She said that they'd been deeply in love, but that James was planning to go study abroad for three years. She didn't want him to go, so she lied about being pregnant so that he would stay. But the plan backfired, and he still went abroad. My mom was so upset that the day he left, she went to a bar and got really drunk and ended up spending the night with a stranger. She can't really remember anything from that night, except the fact that the stranger is obviously my dad, and she has no idea who he is. Wow, this day just keeps getting crazier. I won't lie, I was relieved to hear James wasn't my real dad, especially after the kiss I'd forced on him. But now, after hearing my mom speak about how much she loved James, I realized something. They still liked each other. Maybe this was why all this had happened, so that I could bring them back together. I asked my mom to come back to the house with me, and then I offered to help her find an apartment. She was nervous to be in James's house, and as soon as she was inside and saw the photos of him and his family, she started crying. But I told her about the accident, and she was so shocked. Then she saw my room and started crying again and apologized for being such a bad mom to me in the past and that it was all because she felt like her life had ended when James had left her. As she said that, we heard footsteps behind us and I realized James was home. The moment he saw my mom, he just froze. And then they ran into each other's arms and it was the sweetest thing I've ever seen. I left them to catch up and went to sit outside in the garden. At least now, I didn't need to worry about Rosa. And I guess I had everything I'd ever wanted. My mom was back, and she was like a new woman. And now I had a dad, too. I finally had the family I'd always dreamed about.